All right, well, welcome, welcome you all to 412 Midweek Church Service here for Bible study. So good to have all of you here. We thank you for that. We thank you for all those that are watching online and all of you that pushed the share button online. Very, very cool. We appreciate that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for just giving us another wonderful day. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've brought us together, not only in fellowship, but also to go through your word. We praise you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so let me start by saying this, okay? I believe God wants each and every one of his children, by the way, that's you and I, okay, to live an overcoming and an abundant life. I mean, after all, Jesus said over in John chapter 10, verse 10, he said, I have come so they may have life and have it abundantly. So I believe that. That's what he wants us to have, and that's what he wants us to do. So I've titled tonight's message, Overcoming Your Life's Giant. Okay? After all, God is not a God of failure. I've said that many times before. God wants the best for each and every one of us. I've said that before. And he created us in his image. He did. The Bible makes that clear. So think of that statement like this. Every time we get our picture taken, I would venture to say that each and every one of us hit that pose, right? We put the best side forward, right, for that pose. We want to look as good as we can for that photo op. I think of my daughter and my granddaughter. It takes them like five minutes to get together and pose and do everything they want to for one selfie. So I know that it's true. And God made us in his image. So if we look back into our lives, we'll find that it was our knuckle, knucklehead ways that made us stub our toe when we did. I believe that each and every one of us can say that we have done that probably more times than what we want to admit to. We are the ones that caused ourselves to jump the tracks. And let me tell you, it was not God. It was not God that made us do that. It was our own foolish selves. And here's the good news. God can and he will put us right back on the right track. And here's more good news. Our enemies can be defeated. Any oppressor, whether it's a person or some trial, can be conquered. You see, victory and triumph are promised to the person who will trust God. That's what we need to do. We need to believe in that and call upon him for his power and for his help. When we do that, we can get it. And that brings us to one of the most famous stories in the Bible, the story of David and Goliath, which teaches you and I a great lesson and an example to apply to our lives. It's a story, it's a drama that attracts both those who hear it and those who read it. And we all know it, we've heard it, we've all read it. It's a story of overcoming impossible odds. A young boy, David, he defeats a mighty warrior that stood over nine feet tall. Yes, an impossible feat. No doubt about it. However, through the power of God, David did the impossible. After all, the Bible tells us that nothing is impossible for our God. Nothing. And because of David's victory, he stands as a dynamic example of what can be accomplished by a person who really believes in God. So our takeaway tonight and our lesson will be that we can defeat any oppressor and conquer any enemy through the power of God. That's what we're going to find out tonight. So with that, open your Bibles to 1 Samuel, chapter 17. And follow along as I read the very first three verses. 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Here we go. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekiah and Ephesus and Damien. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. 
The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Okay. So, as we've seen many, many times before, this is not the only battle that has been fought between the Philistines and Israel. They were very, very bitter enemies. They did not like one another. And in these three verses, we find that the Philistines have once again kicked off an invasion against Israel. Now, this inv invasion was uh, immediately met by Saul. Uh, and his army with the battle lines are drawn and the opposing armies facing each other on the opposing uh, sides of the hills, surrounded. There's two mountain sides here. One army's on one, one's army's on the other, and there's a valley in between them, the Valley of Elah. So here's a picture. Think of this now. There were the Israelite soldiers, thousands and thousands of them. And then on the opposite side of them was an invading army of thousands who bitter, bitterly hated the Israelites. They were seeking to enslave them and subject them to serve the Philistine nation. And the Israelite soldiers absolutely knew that they were in a fight for their very survival. You have to know that they had to have a spirit of fear. They were scared. A spirit of fear that was gripping their own hearts. However, they had a greater fear that was about to face them. Take a look at verses 4 through 7, 1 Samuel 17. Here we go. Here's the next fear that's about to face them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Goth, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a brown, bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. And a shield bearer went before him. Okay. Wow. Man, listen to that. In these four verses, we're given quite a description of a very frightening-looking giant warrior whose name is Goliath. He's stepping out in front of the Philistine soldiers. He's all bold. He's all arrogant. He's like saying, hey, you want some of this? Come get it. But now before we get into what his battle clothes you know, really are, let's find out some things about this giant warrior. Yes, Goliath was a giant, not only in size, but in attitude. As a champion warrior, the Philistines, along with his size, he had stopped in their tracks, the entire army of the Israelites. They were afraid. Verse tell, 4 tells us that Goliath's height was six cubits and a span. If that's what your Bible says and you don't know what that is, get your pen out and write next to it here. So just really, how tall is he? Well, one cubic measure is about 18 inches, and one span is about 9 inches. So that makes Goliath about 9 feet 9 inches tall. So let's take a look at those, the clothing that we find described in those verses. Just what was Goliath wearing? Well, we see six items described there. Number one, we see the very first thing is a bronze helmet on his head. Bronze helmet on his head, man, think about that. That'll give you a hat head. It's heavy. Number two, we find a coat of mail, which is really that chest armor that goes around him, weighing 5,000 shekels of bronze. How much is that? 125 pounds. That chest protector, 125 pounds. I used to wear a bulletproof vest. I'm glad it didn't weigh anywhere near that. Number three, a pair of bronze leggings. Number four, a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Number five, a spearhead. Now this is just the head of that spear, weighing 600 shekels. That spearhead weighed 15 pounds. And then number six, how would you like to be this guy? The shield that was carried by a shield bearer that walked in front of him. I don't know, really know how this guy could really shield Goliath. I mean, he couldn't be anywhere near the height of him, but he was going to take the first arrow anyway. So from uh, the looks of all this, Goliath was a problem to be faced with on his terms 
but not with his weapons. Say, what? What do you mean, not with his weapons? Well, Goliath's strengths were obvious. You can't get around his size. You could see it. He had his size. He had his armor. He had his weapons. He had his arrogance. However, he did have a vulnerability. You see, David also had an armor to match Goliath's. But his was invisible. David was spiritually equipped. Paul, over in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, gives us this encouragement and describes in detail the resources that God places even at your and my disposal. He says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You see, our lesson here is this, that too many times we face the world on its terms. On its terms. We, for, we forget about God. And too often we try to use the world's weapons. We don't even give thought to God's weapons outdo the world's. However, God's weapons are not obvious, but they never fail us either. They may not be seen, but they never fail us. So each morning when we get up, we should ask ourselves, are we wearing our spiritual armor of God? That's what we need to do. We need to make sure that we put on the word of God, that we're with the Lord, that we are focused on him. It's the armor of God. We need to do that. Let's take a look at verses 8 through 11. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel that he is Goliath. And said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Their fear didn't get any better. Not at all. You see, in these verses, what we can do is we can visualize Goliath. He's standing on the side of this mountain. He's displaying an awesome appearance and huge size and all decked out in his warrior garb. And of course he presented himself as a mighty warrior. Who could overpower an enemy with no problem? That's what he felt like. And verse 8 gives us a couple of facts that we need to look at. First of all, Goliath cries out in defiance, mocking and, and ridiculing the Israelites, goading them by saying, why have you come out to line up for battle? In other words, why this thing's over with. I'm here. Just forfeit. Give up. The second, Goliath shouts out a hostile challenge that the mightiest warrior of Israel fight a personal duel with him. In other words, send out your biggest and your best. So what would be the end result of this one-on-one -on -one battle? Well, the nation of the loser would become subject to the winner. Serving, meaning becoming slaves, uh, to the winning nation. Now, during this time period, this type of a challenge was not all that uncommon, by the way. Often, opposing sides would make such a challenge to a one-on-one -on -one battle to have it over. Why would they do that? Well, by doing this, it voided a lot of bloodshed and death because the winner of the fight was considered the winner of the battle. It was a winner-take-all scenario. In verse 11, we're told that Saul and the others heard the words of Goliath. And they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. In other words, these Israelites, they're shaken. They're scared. They're terrorized here by Goliath. Now let me tell you all, in this day and age, have or are now or will face Goliath-type giants. We will. We will. We either have or we are going through it now or we will face Goliath-type giants. You know, it's not a question of if, it's when. We also know that we have found out that in enemy after enemy will confront us as we walk throughout this life. 
I'm telling you, there's people out there just waiting. In your lives, my lives, everybody's lives, there's people out there, there's things out there. You know, sometimes our enemies are defiant and they're frightening and we'll feel overpowered and we'll feel overwhelmed. These enemies could be people who ridicule us, who mock us, who oppose us. Maybe they're jealous of us or ignore us, abuse us, assault us, lie to us, steal from us. Could be. These enemies could also be circumstances that create all kinds of trials, temptations, maybe a disease, financial issues, depression, discouragement, or even death of a loved one. Boy, that'll question a lot of us. It will. However, let's never leave out the Jesus factor. Can't do it. Let's not leave out the Jesus factor. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Jesus tells Peter he has a Goliath in Satan because Satan's wanting to sift him like wheat. And in verse 32 of Luke 22, Jesus encourages Peter by saying this, but I have prayed for you. Jesus cares. I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. In other words, watch what I do and then take it on and share it with others. That's our Jesus. So just as Goliath wanted to crush the Israelites, Satan wanted to do the very same thing to Peter, but Jesus assured Peter that his faith would not be destroyed. And that's what we have to think of, and that's what we have to remember over and over again a lot of times. Let's take a look at verses 12 through 15. 12 through 15. 12 says this, now David was the son of that Aphorite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced years, in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. The names of his three sons who went to battle were Eleb, the firstborn. Next to him was Anadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. And the three oldest followed Saul, but David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Okay, so now we finally get to meet David. We've met Goliath. We've talked about him. We see how we can have Goliaths in our lives. So now, let's look at David, our hero, right? We finally get to meet him in verse 12. Let's take a look at David's background. David was the youngest of eight sons, born to Jesse, the Ephraite, from the city of Bethlehem. And Jesse was from the tribe of Judah. And here's something else. He was the great-grandson of Boaz and Ruth, the Moabites. You know, when we think of David, we think of him as what? A shepherd? We think of him as a musician? In the book of Psalms. We think of him as a great poet, a giant killer, a king, and an ancestor of Jesus. In short, one of the greatest men in the Old Testament. However, there's also another side, another list that describes David. We know David was a betrayer. He was a liar. He was an adulterer. And he was a murderer. So that first list of attributes that I talked about of David... It gives us the qualities that you and I would probably like to all have. But the second list of his attributes, that may probably be more true to you and I. Here's another reason that we know that the Bible is true, is the true word of God. We know it because the Bible comes clean and he makes no effort to hide any of David's uh, failures, not at all. In other words, the Bible shows us the good, the bad, and the ugly of all the characters in it. Nevertheless, David's remembered and he's respected for his heart for God. So as encouragement for you and I, since we share more in David's failures than his greatness, we should be curious to how God feels about David. Because God tells us in, the, in, in his word. Over in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, Paul says this, what God said about David, saying this, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do my will. Wow. I would hope that God could say that about many of us, all of us. Man, a man after my own heart. That's God talking. Who will do my will. 
You see, David, more than anything else, had an unchangeable belief in the faithful and forgiving nature of God. He was a man who lived with great zeal. Yes, he sinned many, many times. Of course he did, just like us. However, he was quick to confess his sins. By the way, how are we doing in that department? How are we? 1 John chapter 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Just not some, but all, all of it, all of it. Also, David's uh, confessions was from his heart and his repentance was genuine. You see, there's a lot to be learned there too. A lot of times we say we're sorry, but are we really? Can you tell you, you know, you may, may tell somebody else, another human, that maybe you're sorry. But if you tell God, you better make sure it's coming from your heart because, see, he knows your heart. He knows your heart. It was his, his repentance was genuine. David never took God's forgiveness lightly, nor did he take his blessings for granted, and neither should we. We shouldn't just expect it. We should praise him for it. We should thank him for it. So in return, God never held back from David, either in forgiveness or in consequences for his actions, because he had both. David got forgiveness, but he also suffered consequences, just like we do. You know, actions have consequences. And here's the hard part. David experienced the joy of forgiveness. Man, that's probably, that's a lot easier to have joy over forgiveness. But he also had it when he had to suffer the consequences of his sins. And that's a lesson that we all need. When you have joy over the consequences of our sins, that's when you know that you really, really got it. And here's the reason why, is because you know you deserve it. You know you deserve it. And it's to teach us a lesson, that there's consequences. I say that because what happens usually is this with us. We tend to get the two reversed. Too often we would rather avoid the consequences than experience the forgiveness. In other words, we would forfeit the forgiveness just not to get the consequences. Yep. Man. And that's not the way to think because God's will give us the consequences anyway. He's not going to let it go just because we stuck our head in the sand. Not at all. So why not just go ahead and do it right? Get the, get the forgiveness to boot. Go ahead and just take it. Another big difference between David and us is that while he sinned greatly, he did not sin repeatedly. In other words, he learned from his mistakes because he accepted the suffering that it brought. The problem with you and I, often we don't seem to learn from our mistakes or even the consequences that come with them. In other words, how many times you got to stick your finger in the light socket? Right? I mean, I, I've done it more times than I want to admit to. And I don't think I'm the only one here. Man, that was quick. Man, that was real quick in the back. So really the question for us all to answer is this. What changes would it take for God to find David's example of obedience in you and I? I don't know. We're all different. But you know. You know. Each of us do. In verses 13 through 15, we also find that Jesse was most likely already an elderly man. In other words, he was older. He had three eldest sons enlisted in the army and serving under Saul's command in the war with the Philistines. Now, we can pretty well tell that he was older for this reason, because if you look back a few chapters in the Old Testament, in Numbers chapter, thir in ch Numbers chapter 1, it makes it clear that males who are able to go to war in Israel, they had to be 20 years or older. So think about it. You had three, he had three older sons in the service already, and they had to be at least 20 years old. And it's not triplets. So there had to be a little time in between there. So he's older. He's older. And then in verse 14, we're told that David is Jesse's youngest son. He's the youngest. So he's not 20 years old, 
His duty, because we see that his duties were to serve in Saul's court, actually uh, doing odd jobs, being a gopher. David also went back and forth between working for Saul and tending his father's sheep in Bethlehem. So he had odd jobs to do. He had young boy jobs to do. And in these verses, we find another lesson for us. A lesson for us is that of responsibility of service. Didn't seem like David complained about going back and forth doing these jobs. We shouldn't either. We shouldn't either. You see, we need to take responsibility for the service that we do, no matter what job it is. A good job, whatever job it is, that is a, a, the task that is assigned to us. In other words, no matter what the task is, as long as it doesn't go against God's word, we must be diligent, we must be faithful, performing the task of work that is given to us, that is asked of us. That's what we need to do. Uh, Paul writes over in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, not lagging in, in uh, diligence, fervent in fever, serving the Lord. What's Paul saying to us? Be faithful. It's been said a Christian's flame may burn out, but we must never rust out. That's true. That's true. 1 Samuel 17, verse 16 says, And the Philistine, Goliath, drew, drew near and presented himself 40 days Mornings and evenings. Wow. Think of this. 40 days and 40 nights, this frightful, scary, huge Goliath defiled the army of Israel. Think of this. Waking up every morning, and before going to bed, old Goliath, he steps out and he starts yelling out. He's ridiculing you and taunting the Israelites. 40 days and 40 nights, we're hearing from old Goliath. Hmm. You know, hearing that for 40 days and 40 nights, it, it, it had, had to have a, a big effect on Saul's troops. They had to be gripped with fear. They had to be shaken. They had to be terrorized. They had really become virtually a paralyzed army. So here's the big question. Why would the stare down go down for 40 days and 40 nights without one side or another attacking the other? Well, first thing I thought of was this. I think of the psychological benefit. Think about it, 40 days, 40 nights, you know? Uh, psychological terror in the minds of these Israelites. No, and also this, think of this. Neither side wanted to be the first to be caught down in that valley. If they were caught down in the valley first, they're going to suffer many, many more casualties. And no man, not even Saul, who stood taller than any of the other Israelites, even dared to step out to face Goliath in this hand-to-hand -hand combat that they've all been asked to do. So here we go again with man's problem but God's plan, but God's plan. I say that because in verses 17 through 19, we find that David has been assigned a special duty. His father has said, hey, Dave, come here. I need for you to go back home and get some supplies for the front lines and then take them and check on your brothers. You see, in those days, the families had to provide the MREs to their relation that was in the army. They had to supply the food. They had to supply any extra help. In verse 20 through 22, we see that David has made it to the front lines with supplies and to check on his brothers. He's there. In verses 23 and 24, David, for the first time, all of a sudden lays eyes on this giant Goliath. And he's shouting out his terrorizing challenge. And he sees the effect that it's had on his brothers, the Israelites in the army. He sees it. Take a look at verse 25. 25 says this, So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. In other words, we're seeing a deal made here. An offering. We find Saul offering a great big huge reward. His daughter... And to exempt his, the family from the IRS? Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Just for the volunteer soldier, 
who kills the giant Goliath. In verses 26 and 27, we are told that David becomes angry. Now remember, David's young, he's wild, he's ferocious, you know, he's got that, he's got that deal going for him. He becomes angry that no soldier has stepped up. Like, man, who's going to go out there? Somebody, surely, there ought to be a line of people wanting to take this job. That's not what's happening. And the giant Goliath for the insults that he's yelling out towards Israel, it's not only the challenge that's been given, but what about, all those what about all those insults? I mean, how long can you take that verbal abuse? You see, David, he had a little different perspective. And this is exactly what a, what a different perspective can make. You see, most of these Israelite onlooking soldiers, they only saw a giant too big to hit. But David saw a target too big to miss. That's the difference in perspective. You see, the bottom line is this. David saw a mortal man defying an almighty God. And a lot of times we do the very same thing. We let a human overtake us instead of remembering about our almighty God. It may not even only have to be a human. It could be some type of issue in our life. Don't let anyone take your joy of the Lord away from you. Don't do it. Don't let any circumstance take the joy of the Lord away from you. Don't lose the joy of the Lord. You can lose everything else, but don't lose the joy of the Lord. I'm telling you right now. Our lesson here is David, he knew not to be, you know, that he wouldn't be alone when he faced Goliath. God would fight with him. See, a lot of times what we have to remember is this, that God doesn't run away from us when things get tough. A matter of fact, that's when God's his strongest and his closest to us. Because we need him. We need him all the time, but he knows when we're in trouble too. Something else, David looked at his situation uh, from uh, God's point of view. And that's a lot of times what we have to do. What would, you know, what would Jesus do? We need to look at God's point of view on this. So, you know, some of us here are maybe even watching or facing a giant of some kind. If you're not now, you soon will be. It's coming. So let me encourage you with this. Viewing an impossible situation from God's point of view helps us put giant problems in the right perspective. That's what we need to do. Focus in on Christ. Don't ever lose that focus. You see, once we truly believe and we truly trust in God, we can and we will fight more effectively. And that doesn't mean physical fighting. That just means fighting against the enemy, letting God handle it. I don't know, when I was a kid, I always remember this. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. It's true. It's true. As long as you let God do it, and give him the glory for it. In verses 28 through 31, we find David determined that criticism would not stop him. Not at all. You see, while the rest of the army stood around, he knew the importance of taking action. In other words, something has to be done and done now. This 40 days and 40 nights is crazy. This thing of just standing up here is crazy. David also relied on God to fight for him, so there was no reason to wait. David had that let's get her done attitude. You know, people will try to discourage us with their negative comments all the time. Negative comments all the time. Maybe in some mockery, but we must continue to do what is right. Quick little story. I've been with the prison ministry for 12 years with the exception of this last year and a half because of the pandemic. And I don't know how many times when talking with somebody, you know, they always talk about salvations and so forth. And I say, yeah, quite a few people will raise their hand, you know. How many of them do you really think do it? I said, not me to judge. Not me to judge, you know. Negative comments. Why take that away from somebody? Why mock that? So our sh sh thought should always be doing right will be pleasing to God. Because why? It's his opinion that really matters. I'm sorry, but it's not yours. It's not mine. It's God's. 
Take a look at verse 32. 32 says this, Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Here David says, Here, here, here I am, I'll go. You know, here we find David standing right before Saul. He's demonstrating a strong confidence, declaring to the army not to let their hearts fail them, that he would personally go. He'll go and fight Goliath. We don't need them. I'll do it. And then verse 33, of course, Saul rejects his offer, claiming basically that, oh, you're just a, you know, you're just a boy. You're all caught up in some youthful excitement of warfare. But David, he didn't have any fear because why? He had the Lord. He had the Lord. He knew it. In verses 34 through 37, David begins to argue his ability to Saul. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, man, I have faced bears and lions, saving sheep from being eaten and then killing the predator. So he did have a little experience killing a giant. David explains that Saul, just as the Lord had delivered him from the paws of lions and bears, God would deliver him from Goliath. Man, pretty impressive argument, wouldn't you say? And then Saul gives in to young David and agrees to allow him to fight Goliath. Wow. What, what does Saul say to David? Go! Go ahead. It's, I can almost, I bet it's sarcastic. Go! And the Lord be with you. Right? I mean, I don't know that for a fact, but I'm just guessing, you know? Because here's this youngster kind of put him down in front of a whole bunch of people. Now he's just got to do it. And then in verse 38, Saul's giving in to David. However, he wants David to wear, what? The trusting armor of man. Yeah. Yeah. Nah. But in 39, in verse 39, David, he refuses the army saying, I can't walk with these things. I've not tested them. So David took them off. Man, can you imagine? Here's this little kid. He's probably outfitted with man-sized things. It's like he's walking. You know. What's that? What's that all about? You know, David, he feels uncomfortable wearing this heavy protected armor. And then in the last verses, 40 through 51, we we read that the battle is about to start. So here's David's weapons to fight this fierce warrior in the Philistine army. He's got a staff. He's got five stones from a stream. He's got a pouch to hold those stones, and he's got a sling. Then we notice that Goliath comes toward David with a shield bearer in front of him. Man, he wasn't even going to come out there without the shield bearer. That's a little show of, you know, hey, you know, I don't know. But he's got, you know, he's got, his, uh, he's got his guy in front of him. He's feeling no doubt insulted because the Israelites sent a young boy to fight a famous warrior like himself. Man, don't you know, he's overconfident. Now Goliath begins to curse David by the name of his false gods and shouts out the threat that he's going to kill him and then feed his flesh to the birds. A little more... Psychological warfare there. But in verses 46 and 47, David shouts back to Goliath that victory would be the Lord's. How about that? He's given the Lord the credit to begin with before the battle even begins. The victory will be the Lord's. And the Lord would enable him to strike Goliath down and even cut his head off. As a matter of fact, David continues shouting back to him, saying that the Lord would give him victory over the Philistine army, and the carcasses of the army would be given to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. It's like, hey, right back at you, buddy. Right back at you. And in verses 48 and 49, we find the battle begins. It begins unexpectedly. It begins quickly. David breaks into a run towards Goliath. He's, sling, he's swirling around his slingshot. And then with a ferocious and a, with deadly force, he slings a stone through the air, striking and sinking a stone deep in Goliath's forehead, causing the giant to fall face down into the ground. One shot. One bullet. One stone. One time. It's probably... Not only was that all he needed, but that's really all he wanted, you know? That's what I'm thinking. So just as quickly as this fight started, had begun, David's already gained a quick, stunning victory over Goliath. Mm -hmm. And in verse 51, we find David fulfills his promise to Goliath by taking Goliath's own sword and cutting off his head. 
took Lazarus' own stone, sword away from him and cut off his head. And as we've seen so many times before, the Philistine army, seeing the defeat of their hero, who is now a zero, is utterly shocked, stricken with panic, and fled the scene, utterly confused of what they had seen and what they have just witnessed. Man, they're done. So here's David, a man described by God himself as a man after his own heart, an ancestor of Jesus Christ, the greatest king of Israel, and listed in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. God gave David the victory. Not because he was any better than any of us. Don't get that idea. He wasn't. We deserve the very same thing. We deserve, we, we get God's grace. It's undeserved, but we receive it anyway. But he wasn't better than us. Sometimes we think about some of these people that we read in the Bible or people that we may, you know, hold up to a higher esteem. They're no better than us. They're no better. We get the same thing. We have the same opportunities. The victory came because David was obedient and believed and trusted God. That's what we need to be. We need to be, we need to trust God. We need to be obedient. We need to believe in God. And the victory is ours. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you, Lord. Man, what a great story. The story of David and Goliath, Lord. And Lord, I know that many of us, we have gone through trials in our life. We've had Goliaths in our life. We may be having a Goliath in our life right now, Lord. And Lord, if we're not, we just need to be prepared by your love and your focus, Lord, that that Goliath is going to come. And it'll probably come sooner, Lord, than what we think. So Lord, we just ask you that when those things happen to us, when those Goliaths come into our heart, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that we would reflect back on the David and Goliath story, Lord that our victory can come through you and because of you to conquer and be victorious over those, whether they be people or whether they be incidents or anything else that would come against us, Lord, we pray for that. Let me just say to each and every one of you here and each and every one of you watching that if we're not slaying the giants in our life that are robbing us of our victory, we're settling for less than what God has in store for us. Don't settle for less. God wants us to have an abundant life. He told us that. You see, when we surrender to God, we're able to win victory from every giant that comes across our path. Lord, if there's somebody here tonight that needs to accept you as their Lord and Savior, I just pray right now, Lord, whether they're in this building right now or if they're watching online, that if they need to accept you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, that the Holy Spirit right now would just convict their heart, Lord. And if that's you, just ask for forgiveness of your sins right now. Thank God for going to the cross and being able to be the substitute for you. The Bible says that wages of sin is death. You don't want eternal death. Ask for repentance. Be, ask for help to repent of your sins. Just do that. Just do that. Then tell him that you want to be a follower of him for the rest of your life and depend on him and him alone. Lord, go with us as we finish out this week, Lord. Give us those windows and doors of being open of opportunities to be able to witness to those and to profess the gospel of Christ. And I ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.